It's a pleasure to give this talk about genome informatics. Just a reminder of the institution uh, that I am now, in fact, Deputy Director General of. Um, and if this was happening in real life, we'd be at one of these locations, Emble EBI, on the Hingston campus alongside Sanger. But I am a Deputy Director General of EMBL, an international treaty organization with six sites. It's headquartered in Heidelberg, Germany. It has five other sites, including EMBL EBI. And EMBL has these five different missions of research, services, training, technology development, and the integration of European research. And just to mention that we're pushing forward into a new world of uh, expanding the way EMBL and we hope life sciences thinks beyond the lab to really build a bridge between molecules and ecosystems uh, in the future. But just returning to the topic of this meeting, it, it's been a great piece of nostalgia thinking about this talk because Lincoln, uh, Susie and myself, we set up uh, this series of talks 20 years ago. So this is uh, genome informatics. In fact, I can't find an abstract book of the first one, uh, but this is an abstracts of uh, the 2003 case. And this is pictures of us vaguely at that time. And I have a lot more gray hair these days. Now it's worth thinking or worth reflecting what genome informatics really means. And really genome informatics was the first data science that was established. And if the word data science had been around 20 years ago, we would have called it biological or biomolecular data science. We wouldn't have said genome informatics, I suspect. Um, so we are, in some sense, the first data scientists or the first data science field um, in depth. Now, I just want to also go through these two other words. One word is genomics or gen genomics. And some people can take a view that genomics is, is, is about genome DNA. And that is obviously where it comes from, where this uh, term comes from. But it's, I think, far better to think of this as comprehensive biomolecular sensing of which one biomolecule is DNA, and sometimes that is the genomic uh, DNA. Now, some of you listening to this might think, no, 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 there's, there's a, a lot of utility in having these other words like transcriptomics, proteomics, epigenomics, and metabolomics. But I actually don't think there is much utility in that. So firstly, the subdivision makes it harder for people to understand uh, our field and the skill set and how we think about it. All these things interweave together. You would just not do epigenomics in the absence of genomics of a particular species or sample. And there's the other word that is sometimes used about this is called multiomics. If you thought explaining genomics to people outside of our field was hard, explaining multiomics involves explaining the words genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, epigenomics, and then saying, and now I'm going to use another word called multiomics, which sounds even clunkier to describe it. And so I like to think about genomics, to use the Drosophila or the species taxonomists words, it's, it's genomic sensu lato, so broad sense. Uh, and it, this allows us to use this word in other contexts as well. So for example, genomic medicine or genomic data science. And then just to come on to the word data science. Now the skeptics would say uh, on the right hand side that a uh, data scientist is a statistician who lives in San Francisco. Another definition is a data scientist is someone who both knows Python and R, uh, so can do statistics and uh, data uh, manipulation. But I do think there's something different. I'm, I'm a big fan of the long, long world of statistics. And in many ways, that the very founding of statistics is kind of wrapped up in biology and in genetics in a really wonderful way. But Data science is more than multivariate statistics because a lot of it is in the, a lot of the magic is in the data. And it's in the data in two ways. There's a classic thing where you have to know for the question that you want to ask, do I have the data set that answers it or turning it around for this data set, what questions are valid to ask? What interesting questions are valid to ask? And then this whole drama of not only kind of measuring the data, but getting it, wrangling it, processing it, putting it in the right schemes and frameworks is a big part of it. And that second part is poorly understood outside of the discipline of data science. 
This is uh, my colleague and indeed the supervisor, my supervisor, I did my PhD with Richard here on the right. And he, for me, is an exemplar of someone who has come from maths and statistics and has just simply become a leader in molecular biology. And that is because this science is, is the now and the future of this world of understanding biology. So stepping back, biology is ultimately about understanding how we get order, uh, lower, local lower entropy in the world due to the information. Our bodies, our systems organize ourselves in a way that we create order and we pass that order on to the future. We obviously do that without breaking the third law of thermodynamics. So some, some other parts of the universe is getting a little less, a little bit more entropy, but we have less. And there's a big distinction here between chemistry, we're not just carbon chemistry, um, uh, there is something different, and that, that difference is very much about information. And that means that biology is fundamentally an information science, and that's why I think genome informatics was the first data science, or one of the very earliest data sciences in the world before that word became trendy. And I actually want to place some of what we do now into a deeper history of science, partly because I think it's very easy to think that genome informatics invented a whole bunch of things which we didn't actually. So genome informatics rests on a, on a lot of science and this is a, a group of scientists who I have tremendous respect for, but not least because I got elected to this uh, um, uh, five years ago, very proud moment in my life. That's the Royal Society. So there's a group of scientists and their, their motto was nullius in verbia. What it meant was that you had to show your workings and this is the um, Secretary of the Royal Society. He is uh, Henry Oldenburg, a German from Bremen. Uh, so science, even back then, was very international. So he came over from Bremen and he um, organized the letters that were sent into the Royal Society and then redistributed it uh, via this pamphlet, which describes the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. Um, and uh, this is the first example of scientific publication. And the, the aspect here which is important is scientists sharing their data and their thoughts openly and freely. I want to jump over um, to, uh, um, uh, this is um, Hunt Morgan, a famous fly geneticist who brought Mendel's laws of genetics into the fruit fly. And what he realized, this is him with his colleagues in Caltech on the right hand side, and he realized there would be no progress in biology without sharing resources. It wasn't good enough just to share your uh, conclusions and your study, your write-up, your narrative. You had to also share your resources. And that was very, very clear in Drosophila genetics because to make progress in Drosophila genetics, you needed to have the physical lines which had mutations um, in different places along the chromosomes that you could phenotype. So um, Morgan had this um, expectation that he passed down to his students and then became the norm in genetics and later on in molecular biology that we would re share resources on publication. And then my third example here is, is Margaret Dayhoff. Um, this is her on the left, and here she is holding some computer punch card in the 1960s. And she was the first scientist to realize that you needed to aggregate data, that you needed to pull data together to understand what was going on. Margaret created the first protein uh, amino acid substitution uh, tables using this newfangled thing uh, called computers. And that aggregation is being part of science. Here are two, again, slightly uh, old white-haired men, but on the right is Francis Crick of Watson and Crick and what the Crick Institute is named after. On the left is John he um, Kendrew, uh, the person who determined the structure of myoglobin and hemoglobin, and in fact, the founder of EMBL. And uh, that business of sharing data has become a really important part of our field. And back in 1982, uh, um, a group of people from EMBL Heidelberg um, distributed the first uh, aggregation of DNA sequence data. And uh, interestingly enough, 
they put this statement at the front, it was printed. <laughs> so you, they actually physically mailed it out to people. You could also get a computer tape uh, of the data. So this manual and the database it accompanies may be copied and redistributed freely without advanced permission, provided that this statement is reproduced with each copy. So that is very early on in the 1980s. I just want to remind you this is before the internet comes around. And this thought of organizing the aggregation of data leads to the creation of, in America, NCBI, and in Europe, um, uh, the EBI, the European um, Bioinformatics Institute. This is the first draft of that, written in the Pasadena Hilton by Graham Cameron. And you can see that Graham hadn't quite sorted out uh, the definite, the name. At that time point, it was called the European Molecular Biological Information Services, which would been much more of a mouthful. And a really important moment, but for me, it's an important moment, which is an example of many of these principles being put into place, was the Human Genome Project. Um, and John Salston, um, uh, after which um, uh, the, the first director of the Sanger Center, and after which one of the buildings now in the Sanger Center is, is named, really an amazing visionary. He realized that it was important to have a commitment to sharing these very large scale data sets, for example, the human genome, very openly and before publication. Now, sometimes I think we get ourselves into too much of a debate about whether we should share before publication or after. What we should always insist on is sharing at publication, on publication, share your data. But for very large data sets, it is valid to share them earlier, and that is in, in, um, encompassed in this Bermuda Principles that was written down in 1996. So going on to today, we follow in that tradition at EMBL EBI, and some of my colleagues are talking here at this meeting, and there is a lot more than just DNA or just protein structures to organize, to aggregate, and to distribute, and to analyze. I just want to touch on perhaps our newest uh, big exciting one, which is the bioimage archive. This is about storing images for molecular biology. Um, in many ways, the same mindset as we store DNA and very crudely, the, the, the kind of high quality image data sets or the, 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 the sophisticated image data sets seem to be about the same volume as DNA. Then it might be bigger, but at the moment it does seem to be the case. Now, in fact, we've been doing this for about five years because the EM tomography community has been depositing to a dedicated EM database called Empire at the EBI for the last five years. Um, but we have extended that to all classes of images and we want to work with the broad community to make an ecosystem of databases, analysis and systems around that. So if you're an image analyst or you're an image uh, producer, do please get in touch with us about how to work inside of the systems. Now, I could go on and talk about many, many different things. We can think about metagenomics, we can think about proteomics, we can think about drug trials, we can think about chemoinformatics. And that is why EMBL EBI is really so big. Um, it's not that big when you think about what we do and why the Elixir project, uh, which EMBL EBI is embedded in, across Europe is so important. So Elixir is the coordination of these efforts across Europe, working with colleagues, for example, in the Swiss Institutes of Bioinformatics, or in the SciLife labs in Sweden, or in the Spanish Bioinformatics uh, network. We have a lot to do. In the big scheme of science, it is not so much money or resource or, or organization, but it, we are the kind of data library, the, the place the collective place where this information gets deposited and given out. And just to mention the, the reason why we're doing this virtually and not physically today is because of um, obviously this horrible pandemic and this awful virus. And EMBL EBI, along with colleagues across Europe, including Elixir and the European Union and the European Open Science Cloud, have come together around this COVID-19 data portal the vast majority of the data services here are, the backbone of this is from EMBL EBI databases. And we store the open data around sequences, viral sequences, expression, protein, structure, and literature, and give them out openly to everybody. And we also provide links 
to controlled access data sets, for example, on the human host side, where there are uh, data sets from uh, patients where access to the data must have approval for bona fide research. If you don't know about it, please go to this and explore this. And I just want to point out, you know, a big success story has been the way that we have worked with communities um, around the world who are sequencing the virus. Um, uh, the blue and the red here are all the fully open public data sets um, on the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And in red are the data sets which have come through a new system called Data Hubs. This is to provide our colleagues in the epidemiological world, the infectious epidemiological world, a staging place where they, for example, in the Netherlands, can deposit data, ensure the metadata is correct, do some analysis which is appropriate for their national context inside of that unit, and then push that data with the appropriate metadata to go fully public um, at the right time. Um, I'm also very proud of my colleagues um, across the UK, um, including the Sanger Institute, uh, for the incredibly large number of genomes that have come from the UK. Um, but every genome here is useful and informative, uh, and this open sharing allows many, many groups to participate. But I just want to go back to this meeting and to all of you, and then why you are so important. This is a picture from, from an earlier um, genome informatics meeting at the other location, the Cosping Harbour Laboratory. Genome informatics for me is the now and the future of this science. Um, it's a really key part of what we do. It's a kind of bedrock of both where we start our experimental plans and analysis, but also where we end up, where we deposit, where we integrate, and we derive new information. And these two different parts, which are the two components of this meeting and looking at the people talking, I can see that that has continued over the last 20 years. It is about data and open databases and the appropriate analysis of that data. So thank you with that. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions.